I'm Annie Laurie Gaylor. And I'm Dan Barker. We're co-presidents of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, which sponsors Free Thought Matters. Today's show is a real treat. You're going to meet five amazing free-thinking students. The Freedom From Religion Foundation, which produces Free Thought Matters, is the nation's largest association of free thinkers, that's atheists, agnostics, and other non-believers. We invite you to join us in our vital work to keep our secular government free from religious influence. Become a member at ffrf.org or ask for a complimentary copy of our newspaper, Free Thought Today. Freedom depends on free thinkers. Watch prior episodes of Free Thought Matters on FFRF's YouTube channel. Today, you're going to meet a few of the free thinking student activists and essay winners awarded scholarships by the Freedom From Religion Foundation. Thanks to kind donors encouraging the next secular generation, FFRF is proud to sponsor five annual student essay competitions. FFRF sponsors an annual contest for college-bound high school seniors, for ongoing college students, for black, indigenous, and students of color, for graduate students, and one for law students. FFRF annually grants an average of more than $125,000 in support of free-thinking students, including annual student activist awards. At last fall's convention, we invited three special student essay winners to read their essays. You'll meet two other amazing free-thinking activist students a bit later in today's show. We were truly enchanted with the wisdom and poise of our student essayists. Let's start with Lucy Green from South Carolina who received $1,500 from FFRF as part of our David Hudak 2023 essay contest for Black Indigenous Students of Color. Lucy's ambition is to become a chemical patent attorney. The title of my essay was Atheism, um, sorry, Authenticity and Atheism. For me, the choice to become an atheist was an obvious one. It's difficult to contextualize the moments in my life that caused me to reject religion. But most of all, my narrative is intertwined with the impact of China's one-child policy, which caused the widespread abandonment of unwanted girls. In my case, I was taken into an orphanage after being found as an infant. And then later, I was adopted by a white American couple, my parents, at 10 months old. And then six years later, my father passed. I was stoic when it happened, and having no conception of the permanence of death, it was hard to imagine why my father wasn't going to be around anymore. But it simply became a fact of life that he wouldn't be a part of mine. Of course, at six years old, it was easy to buy into people's reassurances that my father was happy in heaven. But as I grew older and inevitably examined my life more critically, I became bitter as I couldn't understand why everything had to be the way it was and why things had happened the way they had. No matter how well-intentioned, I resented others who went on about how blessed I was to be brought to this country, or those who insisted that everything had happened for a reason. It was difficult to believe in a God who intended for me to be born as an abandoned orphan, or a God who allowed my adoptive father to die. If those were the orchestrations of a higher power, then I didn't want anything to do with it. However, I didn't turn to atheism in mere spite of religion. Above all, I found the Christian argument to be wholly uncompelling. Stories from the Bible were utterly contrived and mytho mythological, and religion was nothing more than superstition. I remained unconvinced by fear-mongering arguments like Pascal's Wager and the assertion that non-believers were eternally damned to hell. Furthermore, it was impossible to ignore that historically, religion has been used to justify heinous acts of oppression. Biblical scripture was invoked to validate slavery. Christianity became a tool for cultural erasure and the subjugation of indigenous peoples. 
patriarchal attitudes of religion endorse the restriction of women's rights and reinforce toxic gender roles. It isn't by chance that the social progress that has been made within the past century has coincided with an increasing departure from religious dogma. Where religion alienates logic, atheism ultimately offers a more coherent and intellectually satisfying worldview, a worldview that is uncomplicated by institutional corruption and regressive bigotry. Atheism has allowed me to unapologetically reclaim my identity. I am empowered to rely on my personal conviction, which strives me to be accountable and stay true to who I am. Moreover, my disbelief in a higher power does not diminish my sense of morality, nor my capacity for compassion. Rather, it strengthens my commitment to ethical values and humanist principles. By rejecting religion and embracing free thought, I choose to live a truly authentic life, grounded in reason, compassion, and the pursuit of truth. And for me, there is nothing more freeing. Thank you. Our next featured student essay winner is Skylar Blumenauer, who won $3,500 after placing first in our 2023 FFRF Kenneth Prue essay contest for ongoing college students. Skylar has been an active community volunteer, is planning to major in political science, and wants to attend law school after graduation. Hi, everyone. Today, I will be reading to you my essay, A Letter to Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene, a, rebu <laughs> a rebuttal of Christian nationalism. Dear Representative Green, I am reaching out to you today to discuss your identification as a Christian nationalist. This concept, I understand, is defined as the belief that our government should declare that America is a Christian nation, meaning that Christianity would become integral to the American identity. I have numerous issues with this, namely that it fundamentally contradicts and opposes the First Amendment, which, as you know, is perceived to be as one of the most crucial amendments. It ensures our personal freedoms and it upholds our democracy. The freedom to exercise religion at one's choosing is essential to democracy, and your espousal of Christian nationalism as an elected official is antithetical to America and its secular principles. If the Founding Fathers intended for America to be a Christian nation, the Free Exercise Clause would not exist within the Constitution. It is always their hope that Americans would be able to freely shape their identity through the separation of church and state instead of allowing oppressors to enforce a single way of life. After all, history proves that governments that align with nationalist causes not only become inherently forceful, but also ultimately fall. Additionally, I would like to remind you that it was Christianity that, Christianity that authorized and exacerbated the segregation, suppression, and enslavement of black Americans during the Civil War and Jim Crow era. As an overwhelmingly white religion, the full enforcement of Christianity would harm religious, non-religious, and non-Christian minorities. Regardless of the arguments otherwise, the Constitution prohibits Christian nationalism and its denial of religious liberty. I would like to direct your attention to 1 Corinthians 13.4.5. <laughs> love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. According to the Bible, Christians are loving, kind, peaceful, and humble. They do not judge, they welcome all with open arms. However, Christian nationalism inherently opposes all of these qualities. Jesus should be followed through true faith, not through forced establishment and American citizenship. Furthermore, the Bible explains that only the church has the authority to teach God's word and governments should surely, solely enforce justice. Christian nationalism seemingly uses Christianity as a cover for a political agenda that directly opposes mandated Christian qualities. You have previously claimed that Christian nationalism should not be feared and that it will solve school shootings and sexual immorality. But does that not oppose everything Christianity represents? To follow Jesus for solely hateful political purposes? To spread hate instead of love? I want to share my experience with the church. During a rough period of my life, I was enticed to join the church by Christianity's promise of a loving, caring, and judgment-free community. However, I found the complete opposite. 
I was told that my friends are not worthy of their lives because they preferred other genders. They laughed at me, telling me that because I am a girl, I have no future. I saw them harass and berate people for nothing but the color of their skin. They called themselves Christian nationalists. This is Christian nationalism, a movement that has likened itself to the Taliban and threatened to make the Handmaid's Tale a reality. In a world such as this, Representative Green, you will lose your position, your voice, and everything that your religion is supposed to represent. After my experience, I renounced my faith and joined the millions who now find themselves in danger from Christian nationalism. Anyone who is not a straight, white Christian, religious or non-religious. Secular principles are essential to American freedom, making Christian nationalism antithetical to America's future. I urge you to renounce your identification as a Christian nationalist and recommit to religious freedom. Only then can you faithfully follow God's word and dutifully serve your people. Sincerely, Skylar Blumenauer. Thank you. Our last featured speaker essayist is Michelle Liao, a National Honor Society member who was awarded $3,500 last year after placing first in FFRF's William Schultz Essay Contest for college-bound high school seniors. Michelle is from Michigan and plans to major in both psychology and political science. I grew up attempting to stay as far from religion as possible. This proved difficult, of course, in my rural Midwestern town, where it seemed most people were religious and half of the livestock, too. <laughs> I remember learning about our impressive collection of churches, over 60 for a total population of nearly 8,000. I would walk around town and see the rising church spires, one after the next, towering over the smaller houses. Several friends were homeschooled Christians, their mothers preaching to me at the breakfast table. These experiences follow me even now. I can still summon the dread I felt as the interviewer from my dream university sat down, looked up, and asked, have you ever read the Bible? To me, it felt as though everyone knew something I didn't. I was the person who, when everyone else had their heads bowed in prayer, opened my eyes and wondered who we were praying to. I could not blindly engage in what could be nothing better than a delusion. There was no basis for anything written in the Bible, Quran, or any other religious text. The promise of heaven did nothing to entice me, not when it meant control over my present life. The punishment of hell did nothing to persuade me either. Simply put, I believed in facts. In the vacuum outside our atmosphere, the soil beneath my feet, and the eventual death of our sun. I did not believe in religion. Even worse, I soon realized how religion was wielded as a weapon to suppress other opinions. Abortion and female health care have become intertwined with religion, two topics that should never have been mentioned in the same sentence. Educational plans in public schools have been scrutinized again and again. National policies have been rooted in religion. I listened to people discuss their religious beliefs at length, knowing that if I shared mine, we could not remain friends. But things have changed with Gen Z, and I've noticed. I've caught the glances my homeschooled friends give their parents, ones they thought were subtle. I've seen fewer Bible verses in notebooks and silver crosses around necks. Honestly, the growth of the religiously unaffiliated has brought one word to mind, finally. Finally, we can discuss policies based on merit, free from a religious doctrine dictating what we should support. Finally, we can listen to others' views without dismissing them based on the moral superiority of one's religion. Perhaps we can even begin to embody the separation of church and state written into our constitution. Maybe I didn't know, as a young child growing up in a Midwestern town, that I was a Gen Z nun, but now I do. And not only that, I know that for the first time in a while, I'm one of many. Our generation has the potential to reshape the very fabric of our society with our changing religious beliefs and challenges of the status quo. I'm proud to simply be a part of it. Thank you. When we return, you'll meet two courageous secular student activists 
who've gone to court to challenge censorship of a drag show by their public university in Texas. Hi, I'm Ron Reagan, an unabashed atheist. When I first recorded that commercial back in 2014, being openly atheist in America was still fairly uncommon. Today, the fastest growing religious group in the country is the non-religious, especially among the young. That progress is heartening, but the religious pushback is fierce and the forces of Christian nationalism are well organized. Our progress won't continue unless we work together so that reason and our secular constitution will prevail. That's why I'm asking you to join the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest and most effective association of atheists and agnostics working to keep state and church separate, just like our founders intended. Please join the Freedom From Religion Foundation today. Ron Reagan, lifelong atheist, not afraid of burning in hell. My name is Bill, and I'm an out-of-the-closet apatheist, meaning I don't really care what you believe, and I don't really think that you should care what I believe. I was raised in South Dakota in a strict Catholic family. I was an altar boy. I served Mass a lot of Sundays twice. We, the, the priest gave us this little card that said, in case of accident, please call a priest. I don't really like that idea anymore since I left the church about 40 years ago. Now, if you find me alongside the road after an accident, please call an ambulance and an EMT. Today's Free Thought Matters is showing off some of the impressive crop of non-religious Generation Z Americans. Two received Student Activist Awards at the Freedom From Religion Foundation's last convention. Bear Bright, a senior at West Texas A&M, is one of two plaintiffs suing his university and president for violating his free speech rights by canceling a campus drag show set up to benefit the Trevor Project. Bear received the Richard and Beverly Hermson Student Activist Award of $5,000. The president uses his Christian beliefs to cancel the drag show that me and my friends and a bunch of other friends decided to put on for charity. Walter Windler is a character. There was this whole protest about it. We marched around the fountain. We chalked up the chalk all around the fountain. It got power washed away every single day. All the other chalk on campus sat there except for ours. <clears throat> Just a little taste of what Windler is like. He posted his whole feelings about what drag shows are um, to, as a message to the entire university, faculty, staff, and alumni, and students. I believe every human being is created in the image of God, and therefore a person's dignity. Does drag show or preserve a single thread of this dignity? I think not. So we decided as students um, to do something about it. Joining Bear Bright as student plaintiff in the lawsuit is Marcus Stovall, a junior at West Texas A&M. Marcus is founder and president of the school's Secular Student Alliance chapter and received the Stephen and Diane Uhl out of God's Closet Student Activist Award of $5,000. A little over a year ago at my new student orientation for college, I attended the organization fair. I was anxious and alone and acutely aware that I was uncomfortable in my own skin, but I was very determined to find somewhere I was going to fit in. First, I went up to every single religious group set up and I asked every one of them the same question. Are y'all okay with gay people? In every group, every single one said no. They'd say I was welcome to come and change my ways at best, a flat out no at the worst, but each one hurt just a little bit more. Once I ran out of religious groups, I walked up and down the rows of tables, eyes on one table covered in colors and flags that was pretty hard to miss, trying to build up the confidence to go and talk to them. But after making at least four or five passes, enough that the people sitting at the table were like, what is that person doing? I finally built up the courage to go up and ask one weird question. Are you guys gay? 
followed by a question that makes my heart break to think about. Is that safe? Now it's a funny story of how I met one of my closest friends in the world and fellow plaintiff bear and got involved with Spectrum to begin with. But I think that the choice of those two questions speak for itself. I've lived in the Texas Panhandle for my entire life. For those who have never been, you're really not missing out on much. <laughs> <laughs> it's unbearably hot in the summers, freezing cold in the winters, and in the spring and fall, it flops between the two in the very same day. The amount of wind and dirt that the wind picks up poses a pretty convincing argument that the region never actually left the Dust Bowl, and the handful of times we get rain every year, it floods. The nature tends to reflect the inhabitants as well. It's one of the most conservative regions in Texas and by extension the country. For just shy of 20 years now I've lived in the Emerald area and experienced the culture there. From billboards on major roadways claiming that vaccines cause autism and that evolutionists are going to hell, to having my car trashed in high school and having faggot yelled at me on my college campus, I've seen and lived the hate and intolerance the region breeds. While asking, is that safe, seems like a pretty silly question, I still remember the fear that just gripped me that summer afternoon as I built up the courage to take that step away from religion towards myself. Unfortunately, from what I've experienced the past six months, if I had to answer my own question, I'd say no. After our university's president, Walter Windler, whose students have started fondly calling Wendy, canceled our drag show based on little more than religious superiority, I witnessed a surge of hate I never could have imagined. I've been called a pervert, delusional, a degenerate, mentally ill, an enemy of the state, a freak, and many other things that I will not repeat in polite company. <laughs> people send us threats, hate comments, saying that our country needs to bring back asylums and place those people in them where they belong, that not submitting to this gender assigned to you by God is rebelling against God's natural order, and one of my personal favorites, quote, the only kind of drag show we need around here is 50 miles per hour down a backcountry road behind a truck. <laughs> the weeks around the show, I couldn't walk around campus without a police escort. And as we gathered to peacefully protest, state troopers surrounded us on the roof of Old Main with rifles in case one of the countless threats we received came true. I couldn't sleep couldn't focus, couldn't eat, couldn't muster the courage to leave my dorm and go to class because all I could feel were eyes on me, judging me, hating me, damning me. Do I regret it? Not at all. Did it affect me? Absolutely. When I found out that the award I was receiving was called the Out of God's Closet Activism Award, I remember laughing at just how accurate that name was. I feel like my life has been a series of battles between the expectations of the religion I was raised in and the person I am inside. Religion used to be a huge part of my life. I'm not sure if I ever believed in God, but by God I was afraid of him. <laughs> I was raised religious, grew up in church, won a pair of headphones in the sixth grade for being an active and enthusiast, enthusiastic participant in youth group. By all accounts, I played the part of a devout believer. I went to youth group three days a week and find my friends, looked down on my peers who didn't go to church, made a point of carrying my Bible around school and praying in the cafeteria, and always wanted to be in the clique of the cool girls in the youth group. For some reason, I never quite made it in. <laughs> I'm not sure when all of that changed for me. Maybe it was when I was 13 and I kissed my best friend, hidden from the eyes of the world and our parents, behind her closet door. <laughs> the irony was lost on me at the time. Maybe it was when I became acutely aware that I was deeply, deeply uncomfortable in my own body and noticed that every time I imagined myself all grown up, I saw a man for some weird reason that probably doesn't actually mean anything and shouldn't be addressed. <laughs> it could have been when I figured out that I was queer and by definition was now doomed to an eternity in hell with no hope of redemption as long as I had these thoughts. I never believed in a loving God. I believed in the boogeyman. Getting over that fear and finally leaving God's closet once and for all is a journey I'm very much still in the midst of. While writing the speech, I realized that despite everything I've done, there's still a part of me that is deeply afraid of being controversial. I'm afraid of offending religion. I'm out of God's closet, but like some kind of black hole, I can still feel it pulling towards me and trying to suck me back in. I've been told my entire life that my existence is inherently political. I'm the scary transgender person that the media is warning you about. I like cooking and embroidery in my aquarium. I always cry when the dog dies in movies. 
and the only music I listen to is 2000 emo. I'm obviously very scary and you should be absolutely terrified of me. I can't tell you what God is. I can't stand up here and pretend that I know. What I can tell you is that the people who have had the biggest positive influences on my life have been the people that the church taught me to be afraid of. The first people to ever show me true kindness, empathy, human understanding, and love were the queers, the sinners, and the atheists. I'm pretty sure that I don't believe in hell, but if I'm wrong, there's gonna be some damn good company down there. <laughs> and this is why what we're doing is so important. Despite pushback and hatred from religious zealots like WT's own lovely Wendy, if I'm able to show just one person that it's possible to live your life how you want it and be genuine to yourself, it's all worth it. I remember what it felt like to be the closeted kid, alienated in his own skin, but far too afraid to do anything about it. I remember what it was like to fight against everything I was taught my entire life and go up and ask Bear, is that safe? If the protests we held on campus showed even just one student that it's okay to be gay and that you will be welcomed at WT, it was worth it. If the $7,000 we raised to donate to the Trevor Project saved even just one life of one queer youth, it was worth it. The fact that I'm able to stand in front of you all now and be comfortable in my own body means it's worth it. My name is Marcus. I'm a queer trans man. I'm an atheist. And I'm done hiding in God's closet. These inspiring free thinking students show that the free thought movement is in great hands. That's our show for today. You can learn more about FFRF Student Awards at ffrf.org slash students. And thanks for watching Free Thought Matters. Because free thought matters. I'm Steve Pinker. In my book, Enlightenment Now, I show that the world has become a better place as reason has been overcoming superstition and tribalism. But the values of the Enlightenment are under attack. That's why I'm a proud member of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest association of free thinkers working to keep state and church separate. Please join me in supporting the Freedom From Religion Foundation to ensure that our government is driven not by religion, but by reason.